Joining us, Gerard Rhino in the studio. Joining us now, Douglas Carswell, the president and CEO of the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. Morning, uh, Mr. Carswell. How are you? Morning, Gerard. It's wonderful to be here in your studio on this rather rainy morning here in Mississippi. Well, is this uh, a bit... uh, reminiscent, shall we say, of your home country? <laughs> you know, in, England, in England, it rains for days, but never as hard as it does in Mississippi. Here you have the real thing, but it only lasts a short time. Yeah. It's, uh, I would say England is more similar to the northwestern United States, uh, it, weather-wise, you think? Weather-wise, fortunately, not yet culturally, but <laughs> weather-wise, certainly. Um, occasionally, you won't see the sun for a couple of months, and when it appears over London, people are not quite sure what it is. They panic for a bit because they've not seen it for so long. I lived out in Portland, Oregon. I was on a project uh, in 1982 or so, I think, 83. And I got there in September, and it was several days. It was like it was just that steady rain. And the forecast is, okay, rain high of 50, low of 50. <laughs> you know, it's, the temperature never changes. And it was several days of that, and finally I asked one of the locals, I said, when is the sun going to come out around here? And she looked at her watch and said, oh, about June. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the many things I love about Mississippi is how the weather changes. You can go out in the morning and it'll be really quite chilly. And by lunchtime, it'll be hotter than it would be on an August day in England. It's, it's all in the space of one day. It is crazy. So I wanted to have you come in here today, uh, Douglas, and, and talk about stuff going on down at – we'll start with what's happening down at the Capitol here yeah, we've in had the a, great state of Mississippi. We, we exist for free markets and to increase opportunity for people in Mississippi, and we've had a big win with something called occupational licensing. This means that it has become much easier for Americans who've got the – occupational licensing out of state to come to Mississippi. They can move to Mississippi and um, they can earn a, earn a living. And it, you know, Becky Curry, Angela Hill, Kevin Blackwell, these, these lawmakers have done a really superb job in driving forward this legislation. Against it has to be said one or two vested interests who quite like the fact that Americans aren't able to come here and earn a living without a uh, certification. So we've made it easier for people to come here. It's part of a deliberate strategy we've been following. We, we started this a year ago. We, we extended these rights in a bill to military families, the Military Family Freedom Act. And having shown that actually freedom is a good thing, we've now, we're delighted to see this bill that we've been behind extend to all people coming to Mississippi. It's good news for Mississippi, good news for jobs, good news for the economy. Yeah, and, and appreciate you mentioning those uh, great lawmakers. Had Representative Curry uh, on the program, I think last week. Isn't she wonderful? She she did a great job of championing that through, and, and we do appreciate that. And I think it is a move in the right direction. I think many would be surprised to know that Mississippi, though it is certainly a, a largely a conservative state, those policies were anything, those laws in place were anything but conservative. Often the laws we have in Mississippi, you would expect to have found in Eastern Europe 30 years ago. I mean, yeah. the idea that I, I find it odd that an American should need the permission of someone else to be certified to be a hair braider. Yeah. I mean, come on. Um, I, okay, look at, look at my hairline. I don't need the services of a hair braider that <laughs> often. But if I was going to go and get my hair cut, I think I could ch- take my chances with, with, with the free market without having a certified um, hairdresser. Well, there's this attitude from government, isn't there, Douglas, especially the federal government, that their primary job – is to make sure you don't do something stupid. It infantilizes us. It treats us all as if we're children. This idea, and it is an invidious and obnoxious idea, and it's central to the progressives' belief, which is that we can't be trusted to look after ourselves, and we need someone in D.C. or some bureaucrat in Jackson to regulate our lives for us. It's a profoundly un-American idea, but I'm afraid to say it's very prevalent today, and you see it again and again and again. We are continually told by politicians in D.C. that they must enact laws to save us from ourselves. Well, yeah. we don't need to be saved from ourselves. <laughs> well, w- w- here's what it seems to me like happens. They make laws or enact policy that creates all these problems. Absolutely. Then they come behind it and try to dream up twisted policy to correct it. All you got to do is look at the pandemic over the last year. A lot they of shut everything down and make everybody miserable yeah. and I, mess up the economy. Yeah. And then here's a rescue plan to fix that. Yeah. Often federal government passes laws, which are the equivalent of, in England, we'd call it a sledgehammer to miss a nut. They, <laughs> they, they bring in draconian proposals, 
which don't solve the problem and create secondary and tertiary problems. And fundamentally, yeah. um, I think the federal government did this going back to LBJ, I think the worst American president ever with his great society. No Far question. from creating a great society, he created hundreds of thousands of people in America who became supplicants. Many Americans who every month, the most important event economically for them is the day they receive their welfare check. You know, it's created a profoundly un-American economic system. And I think we need to rein back and row it back. Yeah. And it just, uh, it just seems like that they kind of exist <laughs> to, to sort of save us from ourselves. Uh, and, but they first got to convince us we're all victims of uh, everything, I guess. Your life sucks, it's not your fault, and we're going to come in and fix it. It's kind of the uh, overarching message. But left-wing extremists have been doing this since the French Revolution, this idea that you know, society can't be left to its own devices. You need a, a, a vanguard of the proletariat. You need a committee of public safety. You need a bureaucrat in D.C. to order your life for you. It's a really profoundly obnoxious idea, but I'm afraid to say it's alive and well, and we've got to confront it. We've got to take on this idea that D.C. knows what's best for us. They simply don't. The fallacy and the ruse of all that, of that concept, though, isn't it, Douglas, that somehow the people in that don't, under that dome, the 535, they're just superior to the other 320 million people out there just trying to get through life. Isn't it? It's extraordinary. We were constantly told that we should leave decisions to experts and to policymakers. But the more we see of these people, the more we realize they're people prone to prejudices and flaws like everyone else. And in fact, when you look at the record of central bankers, I would say their record is worse than the average because yeah. they believed in fallacies that created a boom and bust economy. When you look at epidemiologists telling us to lock down, I would say their judgment was actually worse than that of ordinary people and state governors. So actually, I think entrusting policymaking to experts in DC is a recipe for disaster. Seems like that's what we're doing. And what you know, the $1.9 trillion American rescue plan, this recent round of a so-called stimulus that uh, was just enacted, that we did that, that Washington did that, doesn't disturb me as much as its popularity, if you believe in polls. And it's a large swath cross-section of polls, so you can't say, well, these are all polls that are just polling um, certain demographics. Then how, how much support it? Now we got... Uh, I've talked about it earlier. We got the vice president, the president to a smaller extent, but certainly members of the cabinet jaunting around the country trying to convince people that this is a good thing. Yeah. I don't get it. You, you, you are right, Jared. It is a bit depressing that people accept these handouts from the federal government uncritically, but don't despair because I actually think there will be tens of millions of Americans, perhaps not many of your listeners, but tens of millions of Americans out there who voted for Biden and the progressives um, a few months ago, but yeah. who will be horrified at some of the things that DC is now doing. And they'll be horrified at some of this radical cultural agenda and economic agenda that DC is imposing. So I, I think actually if conservatives and free marketeers respond to this with a sensible alternative, you know, fundamentally, we should understand as conservatives the founding ideal, which is that, you know, Different states should be allowed to do different things. The priorities of folk in Mississippi are not the same as those in Massachusetts. We need a conservative movement nationally that understands this and doesn't try to run America as a unitary state. Yeah. Yeah, sure. You know, that doesn't work for them, though. That, the, the agenda and the methodology and the policies are really more about putting everybody into just one big giant basket, if you will. One big giant version of California. Um, yeah. They're trying to extend California to embrace all of the other 49 states. Um, I think actually what we need to do is to show that actually California is not the way to run America. Right. Um, but what we've got at the moment are the elites who presided over California and New York State for the past 15, 20 years and created the economic and social disasters there in charge of the federal institutions and trying to uh, make the rest of the country like that. Very true. So I wanted to shift uh, the discussion a bit to the income tax reform legislation mm -hmm. that uh, I know that you guys advocated for, mm -hmm. uh, as we did over at Empower Mississippi. So we, we thought this was a good deal. But it looks like it's not going to happen this year, that the Senate has decided it needs more analysis. Uh, your thoughts about that and where we are right now? I think it's a really good idea that we shift taxation away from incomes to sales tax. Why? Consumption. Because 40% of people never pay income tax at yeah. all. So the left 
the extreme progressives only need to get an extra 10% to be home and dry. If you shift the burden of taxation away from incomes onto what people consume, it's fairer. The richer you are, the more you consume, the more you pay.